The elixir, which boosts the body's regeneration ability and is used to heal wounds, is in high demand. The blood of the manticore is a crucial ingredient in creating this elixir, and temples have employed a special purification method to obtain it, however, the amount of elixir produced is insufficient compared to the demand due to the rarity of the ingredient, allowing temples to generate immense profits. Recently, the supply of manticore blood has become scarce at the source, particularly in Dibal, sparking a fierce battle among temples for control over this rare resource and driving its price sky high. The sudden disruption in the supply chain has left the temple authorities anxious, despite their busy schedules, after leaving their partners waiting for about a month, Dibal finally visited the Reynard Temple in the Dajek Empire, Virek, the high priest of Reynard, was taken aback when Dibal was greeted, exclaiming in astonishment, What, do you have three hundred thousand vials of manticore blood? Virek widened his eyes in disbelief and asked, Is that true, Dibal? Dibal replied promptly, Yes, high priest Virek. I know someone who possesses a vast quantity of manticore blood, I figured a place like this must be in dire need of it, but how much can you take? Virek eagerly calculated and then said, The temple is in great need of the elixir, so we require at least 10,000 vials, and preferably up to 30,000. Dibal sighed regretfully, Heavens, that's less than I thought, but still quite a lot, I can bring back at least a hundred thousand vials, upon hearing this, Virek gasped in astonishment, a hundred thousand vials. Quickly running through his mind, he realized that a hundred thousand vials were an immense quantity, however, if he mobilized the nearby temples, it wouldn't be impossible, this was a golden opportunity to increase his influence and earn additional profits, yes, he thought, I can't let this opportunity slip away. After some hesitation, Virek hastily finalized the deal with Dibal, Dibal, I will take a hundred thousand vials, he said, however, Dibal looked at him with a hesitant expression, wondering if it was all right. Seeing Virek's confusion, Dibal quickly explained, every temple on this continent wants manticore blood, so I will sell it to the highest bidder for three hundred thousand gold coins, no less, what do you think? Virek calculated the potential profit and realized that even at that price, there would still be a profit margin, furthermore, the price of the elixir was continuously rising due to supply and demand imbalances, excitedly, he grabbed Dibal's hand, saying, Excellent, Dibal, you will become our temple's largest partner. Virek, somewhat curious, asked Dibal, but with such precious materials, who in this world could supply them in such large quantities. Dibal chuckled and replied, In short, it's the greatest wizard on this planet. At that moment, El stood atop his wizard tower, overlooking the Manticore Valley with a satisfied smile. El exclaimed with pride, It's truly a beautiful sight, I can't believe this place used to be the Manticore Valley. All of this was thanks to a recent plan that was progressing remarkably well, El stood swaying on the tower's peak with excitement, gazing down at the warehouse at the tower's base. Villagers were transporting crates of manticore blood out of the warehouse, thanks to the distribution of manticore blood, the village was gradually becoming more stable and prosperous. Previously, after successfully taming the manticore king, El had moved the remaining manticore pack in the forest into a pocket dimension. He provided them with seafood purchased from Count Luvius and managed them carefully, villagers were then able to easily extract blood from the manticore and began distributing it to the temples. The ferocious manticore pack had previously instilled fear throughout the kingdom. Now, thanks to the management of the manticore king, they have ceased attacking humans. They no longer pose a threat to humans, but the need for sustenance remains, hence, they are provided with seafood, and in exchange, they willingly offer their blood. Due to their special regenerative ability, the manticore pack can live normally even after being drained of blood, this creates a stable blood supply, making the previously impossible task feasible. And thanks to feeding the manticore pack with nutritious seafood, their blood quality surpasses other types available in the market. 
villagers have been able to earn a significant amount of money as the trading progresses smoothly according to L's plan. Furthermore, hardly any of the construction workers are aware that the Wizard Tower is built in the Manticore Valley. Because all the construction workers are transported through instant teleportation gates, they have no idea where the Wizard Tower is being built. Nevertheless, people still marvel and tell each other that the Wizard Tower here is no less impressive than those in most other cities. However, L always reminds himself to remain vigilant, even when there is no apparent threat in this location. As L's intuition was warning him to be cautious, the hurried footsteps of Kana echoed throughout the corridors within the Wizard Tower. L quickly sensed that Kana's footsteps were heading towards his office, and he immediately teleported back. Within a few seconds, L appeared in his office and indeed heard the sound of hurried footsteps approaching. Kana burst into the room with a look of alarm, L. Seeing her worried expression, L hurriedly asked, Kana, what's wrong? Kana was so flustered that she couldn't express herself clearly, it's Serena, she finally managed to say amidst tears. L's concern deepened, what about Serena? Seeing Kana's tears streaming down, L immediately realized that something very serious was happening. Without hesitation, he ran with Kana to Serena's room, upon opening the door, L gasped and called out Serena's name. Silfer was sitting beside the bed, caring for Serena, the girl seemed to be in a deep sleep, showing no response to L's call. At this moment, Serena was in a state of delirium, her breathing heavy and feverish, yet her pale skin didn't appear flushed like in a typical feverish state. As L approached the bed, he immediately asked Silfer, Mother, is Serena sick? Silfer, looking bewildered, replied, Yes. I don't know what's wrong with her, can you take a look?" Her eyes filled with anxiety as she glanced back at Serena, her complexion unnaturally pale, her breathing labored. Immediately, L grasped Serena's wrist and infused mana to check her health. After a while, L's expression turned startled. He said to Silfer, Serena's body doesn't contain any mana at all, instead, it's a different type of power. It's neither the dark aura of demons nor the divine aura from heaven. L hesitated to speak about his speculation, if I'm correct, he continued, the new power within Serena's body is divine in nature, if we make a mistake, Serena could attract the attention of the entire continent. L's expression grew more solemn. Seeing her son so determined, Silfer was at a loss for words, what, Kana exclaimed, equally horrified, how could this happen? L furrowed his brow as he looked at Serena, we can't afford to waste any time, they may have already noticed, he said, Kana, take care of Serena. Kana glanced at L with concern, all right, she said, her voice filled with worry. Then, L turned to Silfer and said, we need to establish a barrier around the valley, Silfer looked at her son with concern, right now, she asked. L quickly turned away, knowing he might not be home for a while, don't worry, mom, he assured her. In the next moment, L stepped through the spatial gate and teleported to the highest point of the valley. On the top of the wizard tower, L focused intently, surveying the entire area and beginning to formulate a plan. He tried to suppress his worried sighs as he calculated, how long would it take to establish a barrier around the entire valley. Regardless of how long it might take, he knew he had to proceed carefully, L looked up at the sky with determined eyes. Then, he stood in place and began to weave magic, unleashing a tremendous surge of energy straight into the sky from the top of the tower. The energy surged upward hundreds of meters from the tower's peak before splitting into tens of thousands of small beams of light, resembling fireworks. These beams of energy intertwined with each other, gradually forming a dome that enveloped the entire valley. Meanwhile, at the Vatican in the capital of the Holy Kingdom of Gaia, a bright light was radiating inside the cathedral. The Pope appeared elated as he stood before a beam of light shining as brightly as the sun, ah, this, he said, 
This day will be recorded in history, this is the first prophecy in three hundred years. At that moment, a resonant sound emanated from within the energy sphere in front of him, where the soul of darkness shone to exist in a world swept by currents, sometimes benevolent, sometimes terrifying. In a place yet to be understood, its beauty shines amidst rugged terrain. It is so bright, yet in the darkest place, light and darkness blend as one, seek the divine flower blooming there. The Pope, puzzled by the cryptic message, turned to his right-hand man, High Priest Artemos, and asked, Did you understand the prophecy just now? Artemos immediately voiced his deduction, If it's about the soul of darkness shining, then it must be the Levitan Plateau, where the soul of darkness exists, swept by currents, it sounds like something related to magic. A place yet to be understood implies somewhere ostracized due to prejudice, sometimes benevolent, sometimes terrifying, it must refer to a person. Rugged terrain likely denotes the landscape, so it could be a location near the Levetan Plateau with treacherous terrain and widespread magic, the likelihood is high that it's where the saintess resides. The Pope was quickly persuaded by Artemos's argument, Excellent, High Priest Artemos, he said, inform the kingdom of Tolian and the Knights of Brilliance that the saintess has appeared on the continent, it's the will of the Holy Spirit, you must prioritize your dedication and act swiftly. The Pope issued the order with an ambitious smile, our current holy kingdom holds the greatest power ever seen, this is the appearance of the saintess we've awaited for five hundred years, even if we have to confront the empire, we shall not falter, those who oppose the will of the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven. Meanwhile, Serena showed no signs of waking up, and her health and breathing continued to weaken. Cana remained by Serena's side, her eyes brimming with tears of worry. Silfer, too, felt helpless, doing nothing but praying for Serena's swift recovery. Meanwhile, outside the wizard tower, L continued his efforts to create a magical barrier as quickly as possible. He's almost exhausted all of his mana to construct a dome-shaped barrier, creating a sturdy defensive layer in case the Holy Kingdom declares war due to their ambition. Several days have passed, but Serena still shows no signs of waking up, Silfer gently strokes her face as the little girl's brow furrows in what seems to be pain. Serena, wake up soon, our family will be happy together again, Silfer says, a mix of compassion and helplessness in her gaze as she looks at Serena. L is also extremely worried but can only sigh, the mana within Serena's body is gradually disappearing and being replaced by divine power, and she possesses more mana than an ordinary mage or knight. Now, the divine power is replacing her enormous amount of mana, so the pain must be very intense, it's difficult for her to wake up, L's eyes are filled with sorrow and compassion. He continues to speak heavily, we may not be able to prevent Serena from becoming a saint. And the Holy Kingdom will make sure everyone knows about the earthly saint, they will do everything to find the saint, Cana also speaks with concern. The Holy Kingdom of Gaia holds the Holy Spirit in great reverence, so they will search for the saint at all costs, won't they? Silfer furrows her brow determinately and tells the two of them, the saint is not free at all, it's no different from hell, we cannot hand Serena over to them, no matter who they are, I will not let my precious daughter suffer. Cana's eyes widen as she looks at Silfer, deeply moved by the sincere affection of her foster mother. She immediately expresses her firm attitude, that's right, I will also protect my precious sister. L adds his voice, indeed, I won't hand over my family to anyone either. He places his hand on his mother's shoulder and smiles reassuringly, we will protect Serena, no matter what. Suddenly, a strange buzzing sound fills the room. A few seconds later, a loud thud echoes, and a magical letter appears in front of L. He quickly scans the information on the letter, it's from the royal palace. Silfer looks somewhat surprised and glances at L, a letter from the royal palace, what's going on? L reads the letter, his expression turning serious, they want me to attend the council meeting. 
Silfer immediately feels anxious and turns to look directly at her son, the council meeting, why you, L, L shakes his head in response, I'm not sure either. L ponders for a moment before continuing, perhaps they want to announce a new tower master, or they want to leverage me to aid one of the three princes' factions. He folds the letter and says ambiguously, nevertheless, the Tower of Magic has long maintained a neutral stance, whatever their intentions, it won't change my plans. Silfer's smile blossoms upon hearing her son's confident tone. She curiously asks L if he has a plan, sensing his assured demeanor, but he only responds with a mysterious smile. Shortly after, L turns and leaves, advising his mother, I'll be back as soon as possible, take care of Serena, Mom, Silfer nods in acknowledgement and reminds her son, be safe, and don't worry about us. After leaving the Tower of Magic, L makes his way to the estate of Countess Livius, he abruptly visits the old, yet unchanged mansion, greeting the Countess, good day, Countess. L smiles contentedly as he looks around the living room, noticing the presence of servants, it seems like managing your estate has become smoother, he remarks. Rowland beams in response, it's all thanks to you. Excitedly, she asks L why he's here today, as she didn't expect him to come for a tour of the estate. L smiles warmly, acknowledging her perception, Rowland nods gently, acknowledging the point, I haven't known you for long, but I guess that's a reasonable assumption. Then, L's smile turns cunning, well then, I'll be straightforward with you, I hope you'll accompany me to the council meeting and let the Livius family step into the political arena. Rowlin is taken aback by L's proposal, our family, at the council meeting, how? L nods decisively, with your skills and the support of the Tower Master, which is me, I believe your family can become influential nobles, moreover, financial difficulties can be resolved through seafood exports. He continues to encourage Rowlin, as for you, Rowlin, who became a master swordsman at a very young age, I believe many knights would be willing to follow you, recruiting them under the banner of House Livius would further elevate your status. So, the Livius family can restore its position, Rowlin's face lights up at L's words. She immediately feels she can consider L's proposal seriously, indeed, House Livius can still grow and stabilize, but. As Rowlin hesitates, L interjects, but it's still not on par with the Terrandel Marquis 8, isn't it? Rowlin is slightly shocked that L seems to have read her thoughts, why the Terrandel family, she asks, L replies straightforwardly, because it's a well-known story, isn't it true that the second son of the Terrandel Marquis 8 stubbornly wants to marry you, they're taking advantage of House Livius's difficult situation due to monster attacks, so. Their condition is assistance in exchange for you becoming a member of the Terrandel family, right? Seeing Rowlin not denying it, L continues, they believe that the disappearance of monsters near the Livius territory is all thanks to their Terrandel family, that's why they constantly seek your hand, even though it was you and I who actually suppressed the monsters. With each word from L, Rowlin's small yet sinewy hands tighten slightly, they are indeed arrogant and shameless. L's voice lowers as he mentions the hierarchy of social status, indicating that below kings and princes are dukes, with countesses ranking lower than counts, he emphasizes that the Livius family is currently in a disadvantaged position. With a slightly harsh tone that stirs Rowland's emotions, L mentions the rumors that Livius can only endure such humiliation. However, he then adopts a softer tone and offers a solution, therefore, this time, you need to demonstrate the strength of House Livius, you can't continue to endure injustice. L brims with confidence as he declares to Rowlin, I am a seventh-level mage and also the master of a tower of magic, I receive treatment akin to a duke across the continent, but here in this country, I can have an even higher position, with me, no one can touch House Livius. Rowlin's sparkling eyes tremble with emotion, L why are you so good to me? Before L can explain further, Rowlin interrupts excitedly, is it, you? 
She blushes and awkwardly wraps her arms around herself before asking in a hesitant voice, what's the price for unconditional help? L quickly reads the vague thoughts in Rowland's mind and expresses his disappointment, muttering, you don't have to make it sound so sinister. Leaning on his chin, L gazes at Rowlin, saying, we're family, after all, so, Rowlin catches the teasing look in his eyes and immediately stands up in embarrassment, rebuking him, I know, I misunderstood, don't look at me like that. L suddenly stands up and paces back and forth with a contemplative expression, she must have gone through a lot of difficulties, it's probably hard for her to accept such genuine goodwill now, I feel guilty for letting her bear all that burden alone, but I have to change the atmosphere now. After some thought, L pretends to scold Rowlin, so, can we teleport to the conference area tomorrow, I'll leave it to you, oh, and I'm a bit surprised that I'm seen in such a light in your thoughts. Faced with L's mock reprimand, Rowland feels even more guilty and hurriedly apologizes, I'm really sorry, L, relieved to escape the awkward situation, chuckles softly to himself. Meanwhile, in the capital of the Kingdom of Tolian, a secret meeting is taking place among some nobles. As the meeting begins, Duke Tujanbalier bursts into anger, slamming his hand down on the table. Tujanbalier's veins bulge as he interrogates the other nobles, what do you intend to do, the faction supporting our second prince is in jeopardy. Tujanbalier doesn't hesitate to criticize the other nobles, stating that their plan to harm the crown prince has failed, furthermore, the power of the faction supporting the third prince is growing stronger, which will weaken their own power. As he speaks louder, he demands if anyone has any good plans. Seeing the other nobles silent, Tujanbalier grows even more furious, speak up, damn it, I want to hear your opinions. Finally, a hesitant hand is raised in the tense atmosphere. Count Brilkent smirks mischievously and speaks up, I have an idea, Tujanbalier nods, ah, Count Brilkend, please share. Brilkend presents himself as a wise individual and speaks with a hint of arrogance, the faction supporting the crown prince has gained significant power, and the influence of the faction supporting the third prince is also increasing, however, we have nothing to fear. Because our faction supporting the second prince can mobilize a powerful military force, all we need to do is. Brilkend begins with a sinister smile, outlining his plan. As the other nobles listen to Brilkend's plan, they are stunned, gaping in disbelief and confusion, unsure of what to say, they simply glance at Tujanbalier, awaiting his decision. After a moment of contemplation, Tujanbalier's angry expression softens into a sly smile, just as I expected from Count Brilkend. Tujanbalier claps his hands together and chuckles gleefully, well done, I couldn't have asked for a better plan, I have nothing further to add. Brilkend beams with satisfaction, thank you, I will do my utmost to ensure that we can execute this plan flawlessly. Tujanbalier bursts into hearty laughter, indeed, our plan will surely succeed, ha, huh, the other nobles, relieved, join in with light-hearted laughter. It has been two months since Serena's mana began to fade, most of it being suppressed by divine power, El is convinced that the Holy Kingdom has also sensed this type of power, but he must restrain his concern for Serena as he accompanies Rowland to the capital of Tolian to attend the conference. Upon arrival El eagerly looks around the bustling streets, so, this is the capital, I've never seen such lively streets before, this is amazing. When El turns back to look at Rowland, he notices that her expression is even more surprised and delighted than his own, to the extent that she doesn't even notice Elle's question. Curious about Rowland's reaction, Elle asks, What's got you like this? Rowland blushes and replies, I've never seen such a lively and bustling street before, it's quite moving. For Elle, this reaction from Rowland is even more astonishing than the bustling streets themselves. Elle suspects and asks Rowland, but you're the Countess of the Kingdom, aren't you, how come you've never been here before, Rowland nods awkwardly, I've always been busy with my duties in the territory of the Countess, so. In Elle's heart, he can't help but feel sorry for Rowland, so, 
she's always had to carry the burden alone. After some thought, L suddenly suggests to Rowlin, how about we take a stroll around and explore for a while, as soon as she hears this, Rowlin's excitement becomes evident. Rowlin is excited but also a bit worried, she shyly asks L, is this okay? L immediately takes Rowlin's hand and guides her along the bustling street. He looks back at her with affectionate eyes and a gentle smile, it's perfectly fine, he reassures her. Afterward, they stroll around the capital, exploring until dusk falls, they then seek out a luxurious inn to rest. Rowlin beams with joy, exclaiming to L, what a delightful day, L responds with an equally bright smile, we should do this more often, take some time to relax like this, Rowlin nods appreciatively, thank you, L, I truly enjoyed it. She laughs radiantly, her eyes sparkling, I wish I could bring the people from my territory here too, as they chat happily, they are suddenly interrupted by a man's voice, Countess Rowlin. Rowland's expression darkens the moment she sees him, sensing trouble. Locke strides towards them with an air of hostility, confronting Rowlin while pointing accusingly at L. Who's this guy you're with, he demands, Locke appears furious, his gaze piercing L, sizing him up, he doesn't look like a knight, a mage, huh, looks like a third-rate one at that, huh, so you've taken a liking to chewing on grass, huh. Locke doesn't give Rowlin a chance to respond and continues his interrogation, accusingly stating, you rejected my proposal because of him, didn't you? He leans menacingly close to L's face, growling with authority, but L simply gazes back at him with a calm demeanor, as though he's looking through him rather than at him. Seeing L's indifference only fuels Locke's rage further, he clenches his teeth and curses at L, you miserable wretch. Locke starts to raise his voice and jab his finger in L's face again, demanding, Who are you? Spit it out, Rowlin, after a moment of shock, manages to regain her composure and speaks coldly, Locke, watch your words, you don't even know who he is. Locke glares back at Rowlin, interrogating her, If there's nothing to hide, why keep it a secret, even if he's a mage, he must be inferior to me, right? Rowlin snorts disdainfully, inferior to you, you're just being arrogant, do you even realize how foolish you sound, Locke's face reddens with anger at Rowland's mocking tone, what? However, Rowland showed no sign of relenting, she narrowed her eyes and retorted sharply, he's just a second son of a duke's household, he doesn't even hold any noble title of his own, yet he dares to be uncouth in front of a countess, unforgivable, he must realize the class distinction between us. Faced with Rowland's sharp words, Locke began to feel uneasy, she continued to criticize him, insisting that he should brush up on the kingdom's laws before daring to look down on them. After making Locke feel thoroughly embarrassed and speechless, Rowland and L walked straight past him, Rowland even turned to L with a gentle demeanor, apologizing, I'm sorry, L. Rowland hesitated to add more, he is the second son of Count Tarendel, I apologize for this, L calmly nodded, ah, it's okay, so, he's the one who stubbornly insisted on marrying you. Locke, seeing them leave so cheerfully, felt extremely bitter but could do nothing except silently curse inwardly. Rowland casually remarked to L, we should hurry along, I feel like I might catch his negativity, L nodded in agreement, good idea. The curses echoed in Locke's mind, damn it, how much effort have I put into winning Rowlin over, only for her to reject me for that lowlife, it's not over yet, she'll pay for humiliating me, even if I have to intervene in the conference. Meanwhile, in the royal palace, King Redolf and Lias were conversing. King Redolf sighed with relief as he looked out into the palace courtyard, thankfully, the Manticore Valley has been peaceful, don't you agree, Duke Lias? Lias smiled in agreement, yes, it's all thanks to the master of the magic tower, the only thing that can stand against those monsters is the golem knight, a golem knight can rival a grandmaster, he's truly a skilled mage, Master Elimus, the owner of the magic tower, is like an onion. King Redolf, taken aback, turned to look at Lias, like an onion. 
Lias cheerfully explained, his abilities are endless, and he always comes up with surprising ideas, we're fortunate to have such a talented individual in our kingdom. Lias chuckled with amusement at his own joke, he's not just an ordinary mage, the more you delve into him, the more intriguing he becomes, like peeling layers of an onion. Huh. After a moment of confusion, King Redoff also chuckled awkwardly along with Lias, ha, huh, indeed, quite a fatherly joke, Lias looked puzzled at King Redoff's response, a fatherly joke, your majesty, but King Redoff didn't explain his subordinate's confusion. He simply smiled and continued talking about L, it's an honor to have a mage like him in the kingdom, but it would be even better if he agrees to attend tomorrow's conference. Lias paused for a moment, then asked King Redoff, but is that possible, according to what I've heard, the magic tower has no interest in politics. King Redoff chuckled in response, huh, doubting him, are you, he's young but his abilities surpass those of his peers, he can see through the thoughts of others, I'm sure he knows what I'm thinking, his agreement this time shows that he will support the struggle for the throne, King Redoff spoke with determination, and his predictions proved correct. On the second day, El and Rowlin were in the capital of the Tolian kingdom, the Tolian conference was underway, an annual event attended by important nobles from across the country. Any noble with a hereditary title could attend alongside their direct descendants, once all the faces had gathered, King Redoff took charge, it's a pleasure to see you all, now, let's begin the meeting. King Redoff addressed the nobles seriously, this conference will proceed without a specific agenda, as usual, feel free to propose anything for the future of the kingdom. Immediately, Tujanbalir raised his hand to speak, Your Majesty, I have a suggestion. After receiving a nod of approval from King Redoff, Tujanbalir proposed, with the constant harassment from the monsters now eradicated, our kingdom has seen a ray of hope, at this moment, we are at the pinnacle, we have been able to fend off the monsters without casualties, and last year's harvest was abundant, this has been the most successful year in the past decade. As Tujanbalir spoke, the nobles on the opposing side all stared at him, what he meant was that now was the most opportune time to expand our influence, the important thing was to show the strength of our nation to other countries. Tujanbalir then concluded with a shocking suggestion that took even King Redoff by surprise, therefore, my proposal is to punish the Hessen kingdom. King Redoff was completely taken aback by this proposal, but Tujanbalir continued speaking, Hessen has been plundering our resources for the past ten years and blaming it on bandits, recently, we've received reports of their soldiers disguising themselves as bandits and stealing food from our people, there is clear evidence, I believe this is enough to declare war, through this, we can showcase our strength to neighboring countries. All the nobles looked towards Duke Tujanbalir, the leader of the opposing faction, those aligned with the main prince's faction glared at him, King Redoff, seeing the potential impact of this proposal on national peace, sought to postpone, this is a serious matter, we should discuss it thoroughly and consider the reactions of other nations. He attempted to delay proceedings, understanding the gravity of the situation, it was essential to carefully weigh the consequences and consider the reactions of other countries. Tujanbalir immediately added, there's no need to worry, your majesty, no one will dare oppose us if we use overwhelming force, many nobles agree with my opinion and possess twenty thousand soldiers, if your majesty allows, I can order them to march towards the Hessen kingdom immediately. King Redoff understood Tujanbalir's intentions, but this proposal was too enticing for him to dismiss outright, if they were to defeat the Hessen kingdom, the authority of the Tolian kingdom would skyrocket, seeing King Redoff wavering due to the potential benefits, Tujanbalir continued, I suggest appointing the second prince as the supreme commander of the army. Tujanbalir cunningly explained, the main prince must protect the kingdom, it would be best to send the second prince to gain experience, everyone in the meeting room understood Tujanbalir's intentions, objectively speaking, Hessen wasn't a kingdom with significant influence, however, for the Tolian kingdom, conquering Hessen could serve as a stepping stone to expand into other countries, 
and if the second prince led the campaign, he would be one step closer to the throne. At this moment, Count Tarendel is the first to speak out against it, Your Majesty, the adviser said solemnly, I respectfully oppose it, last year, we suffered minimal losses thanks to the gods and the courageous soldiers, however, this year may not be the same, instead of focusing on exerting pressure on other kingdoms, I believe we should prepare for the invasion of the monsters. Tarendel spoke with determination, that is the only way to protect the kingdom and its people. Two opposing opinions emerged, causing King Redolf to become even more troubled. On one side stood Count Tarendel, the leader of the Crown Prince's faction. On the other side was Duke Tudjimbalier, who hoped to gain prestige for the second prince through the conquest of the Hessen kingdom. King Redolf looked back and forth between the two powerful nobles, sighing heavily with a hint of frustration in his heart, ha, huh, why can't these factions cooperate with each other normally? After a while, King Redolf spoke again, I understand now, however, one of the reasons we organized this conference today is to introduce a sorcerer. That would be Elimus, let him in, King Redolf glanced towards the opening door, hoping Elimus's appearance would break the tense atmosphere of competition. As Elimus entered the meeting room, the noble's eyes clearly showed surprise at his young age. Elimus smiled warmly at everyone, it's a pleasure to meet you all, I am Elimus. Suddenly, one of the nobles stood up with a stern look directed at Elimus. This action startled Rowlin, causing concern and alarm. Locke stood up abruptly, cursing without regard for anyone, that wretch, I thought he was a sorcerer of the Luvius Duke's family. All the nobles were taken aback by Locke's agitated demeanor, Tarendel, feeling embarrassed, whispered to his son, Locke, how could you suddenly? Despite his father's warnings, he strode defiantly to El, with an arrogant demeanor, addressing him, Your Majesty, there's a matter concerning me that must be reported, last night, I encountered him at an inn in the capital, he was quite insolent. Locke portrayed himself as the victim and criticized El, that third-rate sorcerer had offended a deity, everyone knew the deity had sent a marriage proposal to the Livius Duchess's house, but he dared to meddle in the deity's affairs. Locke's escalating words left his father stunned, although I may not hold a title, I am still an important figure in the kingdom and the second son of the Tarendel family, Tarendel muttered under his breath, visibly shaken, I am a pure-blooded noble as well, how dare he belittle and disrespect me, how can I forgive when he has disgraced the honor of our noble lineage? Locke persisted, shocking King Redolf with his demand, Your Majesty, you should not trust that worthless individual, please punish him. A tense silence lingered in the meeting room, the atmosphere growing even more strained than before, leaving King Redolf unsure of what to do next. Locke continued to glare at Elimus with eyes full of hatred. He smirked arrogantly to himself, thinking, these fools like him will never know their place unless they're taught a lesson. However, in response to Locke's aggressive attitude, Elimus simply smiled serenely. After a moment of silence, King Redolf cleared his throat and prepared to address the absurd situation. He gestured towards Elimus and introduced him with a dignified tone, yes, first of all, let's calm down, this person will become one of our kingdom's greatest assets in the future. King Redolf smiled with a hint of pride as he declared, this is the owner of the Tower of Magic, Elimus, whom I personally invited here, the king's words stirred the noble crowd, the owner of the Tower of Magic, all the nobles exclaimed in astonishment. With the noble families locked in a tense battle for the throne, the appearance of a seventh-rank sorcerer was like a trump card that could reverse the chessboard, as a result, everyone's shocked expressions were evident. The nobles began to discuss among themselves, only seventh-rank or higher sorcerers can create a Tower of Magic, is he saying that this kid is a seventh-rank sorcerer, then isn't he on par with a count, the astonishment was palpable. Elimus's smile deepened as he heard the whispers, confirming his earlier predictions. Elimus's radiant smile grew as he raised his hand high, if anyone still doubts, then I will prove it. 
Immediately after, a swirling vortex of light appeared on the ceiling of the meeting room, slowly expanding and causing the nobles to gasp in astonishment. From this vortex of light, a large amount of mana poured out, filling the space of the room. The nobles were all stunned in place, their eyes fixed on the vortex of energy on the ceiling without blinking, mesmerized by the enormous amount of mana. Tujan Balir swallowed nervously, feeling the air around him immediately become heavier with tension. Even Tarendel couldn't help but be astonished, his mouth agape, there was no doubt anymore, Elimus's power was at least seventh rank. Every admiring gaze then turned towards El, who was calmly smiling, displaying truly astonishing strength. King Redolf burst into hearty laughter upon seeing the expressions of the nobles, ha ha ha, Elimus' magical talent is indeed rare. King Redolf looked towards El with a satisfied nod, they seem to understand you better now, I think you can stop here. El smiled friendly in response to King Redolf, I obey your command, your majesty. Immediately after, the swirling energy vortex on the ceiling completely disappeared, leaving only magical dust sparkling like snowflakes floating in the air. Locke now stood completely petrified, no, it can't be, he is truly a seventh-rank mage. El smiled contentedly as he looked straight into Locke's eyes, issuing a warning, it seems you won't dare to bother Rowlin anymore, but if you dare to disturb her again, I won't be lenient. Though El didn't voice his thoughts, his gaze made Locke involuntarily step back. Tarendel, witnessing his son's embarrassed expression, turned away in frustration, Locke, what trouble have you caused now? Afterwards, El appeared melancholic as he spoke to King Redolf, Your Majesty, it seems I have disrupted the atmosphere, so I request permission to leave. King Redolf watched El's departing figure with regret, Ah, it's been a long time since you visited the capital, please forgive me. El then stopped and replied in a gentle manner, It's okay, Your Majesty. Before stepping out of the meeting room, El turned to look at the nobles with a meaningful gaze, expressing hope for future cooperation. As the doors to the meeting room closed, a silence enveloped the atmosphere, both factions of the crown prince and the second prince forgot about the argument they were having. Raulin quietly chuckled at El's cool presence, finding it amusing. King Redolf then redirected his gaze back to the conference table, he is the savior of our kingdom and the most important talent in our land. I hope everyone respects him, King Redolf's statement subdued the atmosphere of the meeting, it was understood without words that Prince Judmian, backed by powerful forces within the royal family, had the highest chance of becoming the next king. The fact that King Redolf openly defended the owner of the magical tower meant that the growing power of the tower's owner would benefit King Redolf, this also implied an increase in Prince Judmian's advantage, as he had the support of King Redolf. Tarendel, observing the situation clearly, felt uneasy. In this case, it could be concluded that the owner of the magical tower also supported Prince Judmian. Tujan Balir also shared the same sense of worry as Tarendel, realizing that their faction needed to be more cautious from now on. Seeing the expected reactions from the nobles, King Redolf spoke up, we must consider the power of the owner of the magical tower in relation to the issue concerning the kingdom of Hessen, therefore, it's best to set that aside for now. King Redolf smiled satisfactorily and asked the nobles, is there anything else that needs discussion? No one had any further comments, so King Redolf declared, then why don't we conclude the meeting, if any of you have other questions about the owner of the magical tower, let's save them for the post-meeting banquet. After the meeting ended smoothly, that evening, King Redolf made his way to a room located at the end of the deepest corridor in the palace. The long corridor was completely silent, with only the sound of King Redolf's footsteps filled with concern. King Redolf personally knocked on Princess Elisa's room instead of sending someone to announce his arrival. A gentle voice from inside the room replied, Yes, King Redolf, please come in. Elise, upon recognizing the voice of her father, immediately brightened up and said, Father, please come in. 
King Rigoff entered his daughter's reading room with a gentle smile, so you're here, my dear. He glanced around at the bookshelves in the room, noticing the addition of new books, and remarked, Princess, you truly have a love for books. King Rigoff warmly praised his daughter, Elise, at just seventeen years old, you are the most intelligent and diplomatic princess, that's why I have great trust in you. Elisa's smile brightened, thanking her father for the praise, she then asked, What brings you here, father? King Rigoff wanted to persuade Princess Elise regarding the future of the kingdom, specifically proposing a marriage with El, he believed that only by forming a family could he harness El's unparalleled power for the kingdom's benefit. Worried that his daughter might object, King Rigoff tried to convince her, explaining that this was for the greater strength and prosperity of the nation, he suggested that Elise meet El at the upcoming banquet, confident that she would like him once they met. As a father, I feel that my daughter should marry the owner of the magic tower, but he doesn't want to force her, so he gently said, Elise, knowing how much I love you, I would like you to consider meeting and talking to the owner of the magic tower. Elise, aware of her father's deep affection, didn't refuse his request, she replied, Yes, father, if it's your wish, I will meet and converse with him. With a playful smile, Elise quickly closed the book in her hand, in truth, she was also curious about what kind of person he was. King Rigoff was extremely pleased with his daughter's reaction, I understand, he said. Then he quickly left the room, saying, let's meet at the banquet tomorrow, Elise obediently nodded, yes, your majesty. After King Rigoff left, Elisa's mood remained unchanged, she calmly placed the book back on the shelf. Elise whispered to herself with a gentle smile, thinking about the owner of the golden tower with the emblem of a golden sun, Elimus. She wondered what he was like, feeling a bit excited as she gazed at the moon drifting outside the window. The next day, at the royal banquet hall, the nobles had gathered in anticipation of El's appearance, they were all very curious and eager to see him. When I was still in the banquet hall, El curiously glanced at Rowlin, um, this duke, why was she laughing then? Rowlin asked him in confusion, what do you mean, when was that, El replied promptly, well, it was when I left that meeting, Rowlin immediately exclaimed, at that moment, I was just thinking, true to your reputation. Rowlin straightforwardly expressed interest, saying that with people like them, it's better to use practical actions rather than empty words, they wouldn't dare to cause trouble with the duke again. L nodded in response, oh, I understand now, but your clothes, Rowlin glanced at L with a slight frown, is there something wrong with them? L looked from head to toe at Rowlin and couldn't find the femininity in her outfit, he sighed softly, you're not wearing a dress, but a knight's uniform, it's a party today. Rowlin laughed carelessly, am I here to seduce men, why do I need to wear a dress, wearing a knight's uniform is fine, El thought about it and found it reasonable. But right after that, Rowlin teased him again, oh my, do you want to see me in a dress, huh, upon hearing this, El's eyes revealed a clear disdain along with a sigh. Seeing El's reaction, Rowlin pouted and rebuked, what I meant was, you could lie with good intentions, you're too naughty, I'm also a woman, you know. El chuckled mischievously, hee hee, all right then, today I will escort you, Duchess Livius, shall we go in now, immediately after, the two of them linked arms and entered the banquet hall. The banquet was organized on a grand scale in a solemn atmosphere, with the descendants of noble families in the hall eagerly looking forward to meeting El, the master of the magical tower, whose reputation was truly enticing. Whispers and murmurs filled the air as soon as El stepped into the banquet hall, the master of the magical tower, El, quickly captured everyone's attention with his presence, drawing all eyes towards him. Along with that, people also showed more warmth towards Rowlin, greeting her as Duchess Livius. Rowlin smiled radiantly, feeling joyful and almost like in a dream, from ordinary earls to those deeply involved in political affairs, she was surprised that they took the initiative to engage in conversation with her. She glanced at El gratefully in silence, 
although perhaps they wanted to befriend L rather than herself, still, this was a rare opportunity, and she had to do everything possible to revive her family's reputation. Rowland greeted the noble guests warmly, saying, It's a pleasure to meet you all, I'm delighted to be here. L felt pleased to see Rowland starting to socialize with the other nobles, hoping that she would seize this good opportunity. Not long after, the announcement resounded once again throughout the banquet hall as King Redolf and Elise entered, the king and his consort were making their way in. King Redolf took his seat at the center stage of the banquet and cheerfully announced, Today's banquet is to welcome the master of the magical tower, Elimus, the master of the magical tower will forge an alliance with us. King Redolf looked towards El, stating that the master of the magical tower would present a gift to them before the start of the banquet today. El was taken aback, his eyes widening in surprise, he was completely caught off guard by the king's request, uh, why suddenly, he thought. Although unsure of what to do, the eager looks from everyone at the banquet made El unable to refuse. After a moment of thought, El confidently stepped forward to the center of the banquet hall. In a calm manner, El introduced himself, saying, I am Elimus, the master of the newly emerged magical tower in the kingdom of Tolian, thank you all for organizing this welcoming banquet for me. Then, El raised his hands in front of his chest and with focused magic, transformed the tense atmosphere into a display of surprise as virtual flowers suddenly appeared in his hands. The magic carried the scent of the flowers, spreading throughout the banquet hall and permeating the minds of the nobles, leaving them in awe of the beauty of magic. El then smiled gently, hoping that everyone would enjoy the banquet. The magic dispelled the tension like a refreshing breeze, helping the nobles, who were embroiled in the struggle for power and position, to relax. While everyone was immersed in the comfortable atmosphere, El stepped out onto the balcony, ignoring the wistful glances. Standing on the balcony, El sighed deeply in exhaustion, being in a crowded place always drains me, he thought, in my past life, I became a professional gamer just to make money, I can't get used to those curious looks, and moreover, this place is full of factional conflicts, the more I think about it, the heavier life feels. L's introspective moment on the balcony revealed his inner struggle with the complexities of social interactions and the weight of his past experiences. When L's heavy sighs continued to escape his lips, a graceful figure slowly approached from behind him. Elise smiled brightly and greeted L, so, you're here. El immediately hid his look of weariness and turned to face Elise, saying, Princess Elise. Elise looked momentarily surprised, Oh, you know who I am, El smiled and nodded, saying, How could I not recognize the princess of the kingdom? Elise then smiled brightly, expressing her pleasure in meeting El, the master of the magical tower. She intertwined her fingers nervously, You're quite sharp, so I suppose you've also guessed the reason why I'm here. Elle looked at the princess's nervous and excited expression, quickly understanding her intention. He raised an eyebrow with a hesitant expression and asked, Has your majesty advised you to marry me? I know you're a smart and diplomatic girl, princess. Elle spoke candidly about his deduction, someone who had turned down many proposals, he understood that there could only be one reason why the princess actively approached him for a conversation. Elise nodded slightly with a shy smile, you guessed right, you truly are an amazing person. Just as Elle felt that Elise might be pressured into this, she suddenly beamed with a bright smile, but I'm not here just because of my father's request, I'm genuinely interested in you, she said. L couldn't help but be surprised, his eyes widening, with me. Elise looked at L with sparkling eyes full of curiosity, I heard you're around my age but already a seventh rank mage, how could I possibly reject meeting someone so outstanding? L was shocked by Elise's enthusiastic attitude, what's going on, why has their demeanor changed completely like this, he wondered. Not noticing L's bewildered expression, Elise innocently asked, how did you acquire that level of power? 
El chuckled warmly and replied with a modest tone, I don't know if you believe it or not, but I self-taught myself. Elise exclaimed in surprise, Really, you're truly a prodigy. El smiled gently, A prodigy, how can that be, whether I'm seventh or eighth rank, I'm still just me, a normal person among billions in this world, I'm not that different. Elise was amazed by El's mature demeanor and pondered, I'm just curious if your thoughts are similar to others, because you've achieved such a high level of magical proficiency at a young age. The princess expressed her inner turmoil, I am the princess of the kingdom of Tolian, a woman with all the rights and duties, but I lack the power to do what I want, currently, I can follow my own desires, but this won't benefit the royal family. Elise spoke with a melancholic tone, one day, I'll have to marry for the sake of the royal family's interests, and marriage is also my duty to the nation. El nodded confidently and reassured Elise, No, princess, you don't have to worry about that. He smiled sweetly and advised her, There are many other ways you can contribute to the kingdom besides marriage, so, don't worry about it. Elise was almost startled by El's advice, he continued, What matters most is what you desire, princess, sacrificing oneself is not necessarily a noble act, I'd be happy to help you achieve what you want. El gracefully expressed his refusal with a warm smile, you understand my intention, don't you, let's go back to the banquet now. Shortly after, while Elise was still stunned by El's advice and rejection, he smoothly walked past her and returned to the Grand Hall. After a moment of bewilderment, Elise suddenly felt her heart fluttering, he truly is an amazing person, understanding me like that, she murmured softly to El, thank you, thank you very much. El continued walking with a satisfied smile, still not intending to marry at this time, especially not in a politically arranged marriage devoid of emotions. As El passed by the window leading to the balcony, he was briefly startled to see Rowlin standing there, what are you doing here, he asked. Rowlin chuckled teasingly, just resting, just so you know, I didn't intend to eavesdrop on your conversation with the princess. L brushed off Rowlin's teasing and said, Right, Countess, I have something to discuss with you. Rowlin leaned in, curious, and L continued, I'm not being arrogant, but I hope you can get the support of your noble group to back the third prince's faction. Rowlin's mischievous smile widened as she understood, so, you think if I join the third prince's faction, it will balance the power scales in the kingdom, right? El nodded calmly, exactly, you've also noticed, currently, the country is divided into two factions, the first prince's and the second prince's, strengthening the third prince's faction will balance the situation. A pleased and somewhat mischievous smile appeared on Rowland's lips. She didn't even need to think twice before nodding, I'll listen to whatever proposal you have, I trust you, L, just say what you need to say. L smiled and shook hands with Rowlin, saying, Thank you, Rowlin nodded in response, I should be the one thanking you. Meanwhile, in the forest outside the capital of the kingdom of Tolian, footsteps echoed loudly. A group of people from the Vatican Tower had made their way here, finally, we've arrived, the spokesperson, Grand Sage Artemos, announced, leading the group to their destination. They looked down at the capital of the Kingdom of Tolian with eyes full of ambition. The leader of the group solemnly declared to the rest of the members, We, the Knights of Radiance, will search for and rescue the Holy Maiden at all costs. The next day, the leader of the Knights of Radiance approached King Redoff and delivered the shocking news of the prophecy, leaving him astonished, what are you saying, he exclaimed. King Redolf was both elated and concerned as he immediately sought confirmation, the holy maiden from the prophecy is in our kingdom, you say, Grand Sage Baal. Baal smiled warmly and nodded, yes, your majesty. The holy maiden, who will save this continent from the dark forces, was born here, and what could be more auspicious for the kingdom of Tolian, King Redolf appeared skeptical, are you sure she was born here, Baal firmly affirmed, our diviners have also searched in neighboring kingdoms. King Redolf pondered deeply, 
but our diviners haven't sensed anything unusual, she must be here, then, he then mused, could it be because of the border of this kingdom, do you think so, Baal, I've never considered this before, so it's quite surprising. In King Redoff's heart, there was silent joy, if the holy maiden truly resided here, the kingdom's power would significantly increase. Although possessing equal military strength and territory, the Holy Kingdom had one of the ten grand sages, making them stronger than Tolian. Therefore, King Redoff's joy quickly turned into anxiety, not only our kingdom but also other nations were not strong enough to confront them. Thinking so, King Redoff reluctantly abandoned the idea of keeping the saintess and asked Baal, what can we do to help you? Baal still smiled falsely, saying that currently, they gods could control the saints' power by their own divine power. So the gods don't really need your help, they just need a guide to lead the holy knights to the legendary thundering land. King Redolf looked more astonished as he asked Baal, a guide, you say, and where exactly is this legendary thundering land that you speak of? Baal chuckled mischievously in response, it's a place near the rugged cliffs of the Levetan Plateau. He added Artemo's speculation, suggesting that it might be close to the land of monsters located on the western side of the continent. King Redolf was shocked because that was where El was currently residing, he tried to conceal his astonishment and said, Oh, I see, but how? He immediately expressed concern for the group coming from the Holy Kingdom, noting that the terrain there was quite treacherous, he warned that this journey would be very challenging. Right after that, King Redolf made an excuse and left, saying, I will issue the order for you to depart tomorrow, rest today, Baal, seeing that his purpose had been achieved, smiled contentedly and thanked his majesty. King Redolf tried to maintain a calm demeanor as he left the council hall. However, as he walked down the corridor leading to the room of the sorcerer Desilin, his footsteps started to quicken, feeling troubled, this prophecy, he muttered under his breath. The saintly maiden's relationship to the owner of the magic tower is not clear, if so, King Redolf strides anxiously. King Redolf finally could not contain his unease and feverishly sought Desilin, 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 where are you? King Redolf hastily flung open the doors of the palace's magic room. His agitated actions startled Desilin, leaving him bewildered, Your Majesty, what's the matter? King Redolf urgently grabbed Desilin's shoulders and shook him hard, saying, Quickly, help me contact the magic tower, something big is about to happen. Meanwhile, in the Manticore Valley, establishing a complete boundary spell over the valley is taking a considerable amount of time. L, ranked 7th, and Silfer, ranked 6th, have been working continuously for the past year to complete this boundary. L smiled with satisfaction as she touched the magical barrier she designed, now, it's safe. Taking advantage of the erosion of the land, L and her daughter stacked protective spells onto the boundary, if the mana flow of the boundary is disrupted by other sorcerers besides them, it will impose limitations on them, if someone enters this area, their powers will be suppressed. Silfer also smiled contentedly as she looked at her son, who was growing more and more mature, L, this boundary is truly magnificent. L nodded and said to her mother, although nothing is happening right now, we should still be cautious. Just then, Kana rushed over to where L and her mother were, L, L, L immediately asked her, Kana, what's wrong? Kana spoke with a serious tone, someone called me through the magic mirror. After a moment of astonishment, L immediately realized that something was amiss. His eyes sharpened, and he began to contemplate his own thoughts. L carefully instructed Silfer, Mother, please go rest, Silfer, you should also take it easy, Silfer, feeling uneasy, looked at her son and nodded in agreement, yes, all right. Immediately after, L teleported back to the office in the magic tower. Silfer anxiously glanced towards the magic tower, her intuition telling her that something was amiss. It only took a few seconds for L to return to his office in the magic tower. 
he immediately glanced at the magic mirror emitting a faint light. L hurriedly approached the mirror, which was making buzzing sounds like a vibrating phone. He raises his hand in front of the mirror and uses magic to open a connection for the conversation. As the image becomes clear, reflected in the mirror is King Redoff with a worried expression. King Redoff quickly gets to the point, it's been a long time since they last met, the master of the magic tower, there must be an urgent matter, El furrows his brow, what is it, your majesty, could it be? The envoy of the holy kingdom has made a request, hasn't he, El addresses the issue directly before King Redoff even speaks. The king's face contorts with increased unease, how did you know, he asks. El calmly explains, I heard rumors, the envoy of the holy kingdom went to the kingdom of Tolian, King Redoff hesitates for a moment before asking directly, so, is the saintess really with you? El hesitates for a moment but ultimately admits, yes. King Redoff expresses his concern, if the saintess is with El, conflict will be unavoidable, he asks if El has a plan, they are devout zealots, even death won't stop them, he warns. El responds succinctly, she is a member of my family, so I cannot turn a blind eye. El briefly recounts everything to King Redoff, a female sorceress suddenly fell unconscious one day and gradually lost all her mana, only for her body to be filled with divine power, we were all surprised, El admits. But we couldn't just hand her over because of her newfound divine power, El says with determination. He recounts with a choked voice, it was my mother who freed her from slavery and cared for her as a family member, my mother would never allow her to live the life of a captive saint. King Redoff nods with a mixture of sympathy and perplexity, but the other party is the Holy Kingdom, a powerful nation with countless holy knights, even if you are a seventh rank, it won't be easy to deal with them, he warns. L becomes more determined as he speaks, showing his unwavering resolve, no matter what happens, I will never give up, no, I am confident that I can protect her, he asserts. He looks up at King Redoff with a confident gaze, if I can't protect the one I cherish, how can I dare to call them my family? King Redoff can't help but be moved, his face lighting up at El's admirable determination. El sincerely asks of him, Your Majesty, may I ask one thing of you, I hope you can maintain a neutral stance until this matter is resolved. King Redoff responds with a gentle smile, neutral, very well, if that's what you ask, El smiles back, expressing his gratitude, yes, if you keep your promise to remain neutral, I won't provoke any conflict with the Holy Kingdom and will handle this matter myself, El confirms. King Redoff shows unwavering support for El, I understand, I will also be careful not to let information about the tower's location leak, but for the kingdom's interests, I cannot refuse their request for search, he explains, so, finding the magic tower is just a matter of time. El nods in agreement, acknowledging the inevitability of the situation, if they search thoroughly, they will find us eventually, but it will take at least a month, I will come up with a plan before then, he assures. King Redoff responds with a gentle smile, understood, master of the magic tower, I hope you understand this, he speaks sincerely, you are a valuable member of the kingdom of Tolian, if there ever comes a day when we cannot be by your side to help you, El understands the unspoken sentiment behind the king's words. We still hope you will be safe, King Redoff expresses his concern once more. El smiles warmly at King Redoff and says, thank you, he feels touched by the care and concern shown towards him, it's a comforting feeling to know that someone else cares about his well-being. He bids farewell to King Redoff before the call ends through the mirror, I will see you again. Right after that, El turns and strides towards the window. He pushes open the office door and looks out at the panoramic view of the Manticore Valley. Facing an impending crisis, El wants to gaze upon the fruits of his labor over the years and draws in a deep breath for motivation. He clenches his fist with determination and resolve, I will protect my family, the ones I love, at any cost. If El's declaration, the sunlight shines brightly and warmly across the Manticore Valley.
One month later, with no clear guidance from the king, Baal leads the group of righteous knights out of the royal palace and towards the territory of Livius to search for the saintess. Rowlan warmly welcomes Baal into her dilapidated mansion, apologizing for making him wait. She extends her hand in greeting, expressing her delight at meeting him, I am Rowlan Livius, I heard you traveled a long way to get here, you must be very tired after your journey. Baal chuckles wryly, yes, indeed, I've been walking for a whole month to get here, so, yeah, inwardly, he silently laments, feeling that the guide recommended by the king might be directionally challenged. A month ago, the guide had smiled warmly and assured Baal, the valley you are looking for is in this direction, Baal had shown skepticism at that time, really, but I thought it was in the opposite direction. However, the guide remained firm, pointing in the opposite direction confidently, it's definitely this way, I was born and raised in the kingdom of Tolian, no one knows the way better than me, you can trust me, I will lead you to the saintess. Despite his doubts, Baal reassures himself, it can't be wrong, he seems dedicated in guiding, and if the king recommended him, he must be reliable. Raulan laughs lightly and asks Baal, so, may I ask why Baal, the pillar of the holy kingdom, has come to visit this place? Baal immediately gets to the point, I'm sure you already know that we are searching for the saintess of the kingdom of Tolian, we would greatly appreciate your assistance in finding her. Raulan smiles brightly, nodding without hesitation, of course, I am more than happy to help with all my strength. Baal continues, the prophecy says she is in a place abundant with magic, in the harsh land of the Levedan Plateau, do you have any idea where that might be? Raulan, upon hearing this, immediately recognizes the description fitting the Manticore Valley perfectly, however, she pretends to ponder deeply. Raulan slowly contemplates with murmurs, the terrain around here is quite rugged and dangerous, a place teeming with magic, hmm. Suddenly, Baal's gaze sharpens, may I inquire about something, there are rumors that a new magic tower has appeared in the kingdom of Tolian, do you happen to know its whereabouts? Raulan appears momentarily puzzled at the mention of the magic tower, a magic tower, I've only heard rumors about it, but I don't know its exact location, she admits. Baal chuckles knowingly, seeming to have noticed Rowland's momentary confusion. He continued to provide clues that left Rowland even more puzzled, I've tried searching around here, but there's no trace whatsoever, I speculate that it might be in the Manticore Valley. Certainly, Rowland became even more agitated than before, oh, the Manticore Valley, you shouldn't go to such a dangerous place, and besides, you're unlikely to find anything there. Baal's smirk deepened, yet strangely, even though we wandered around, we didn't encounter a single monster, it's as if all the creatures have vanished elsewhere. The more Raulin listened, the more flustered she became, stumbling over her words, um, well, that's, that's quite something. She forced a flattering smile towards Baal, you're truly remarkable, sir. Raulin attempted to offer a justification, suggesting that perhaps it was because of Baal's powerful aura that even the monsters dared not approach the area. Upon seeing Rowland come up with such a forced excuse, Baal couldn't help but silently chuckle wickedly, he had determined the location of the magic tower based on Rowland's reactions. Then, with a feigned bashful smile, Baal said to Rowland, Oh my, how embarrassing, you're giving me too much credit, I suppose it's just luck. Immediately after, he stood up and made excuses to leave hastily, well, I've completed my investigation here, so I'll be off to gather more information elsewhere, sorry for the inconvenience. Seeing Baal hastily leave, his assistant approached him curiously, addressing him respectfully, Great Baal. Baal's assistant whispered cautiously, The saintess is, Baal immediately nodded subtly, The saintess is at the magic tower in the Manticore Valley. A sinister smile spread across Baal's face, we've found her location, now, all we need to do is follow through. He chuckled with satisfaction, finding the saintess is our top priority, let's go. Rowland stood by the living room window, watching Baal hurriedly leave through the mansion gates, 
she quietly observed his departure. However, Rowlin didn't show any concern for Elle, instead, she wore a smug smile, though her acting might have been a bit transparent, thankfully, it was effective as long as they reacted according to the plan. Rowlin chuckled mischievously, pleased with having successfully led them to the tower, now, the rest relied on Elle. She murmured to herself with a warm smile, remember to take care of yourself, mistress of the magic tower, shortly after, the group from the Holy Kingdom arrived near the forest close to the Manticore Valley. A subordinate of Baal reminded everyone, there may not be any monsters, but the terrain is difficult, we must remain vigilant. Baal pursed his lips in disdain, the mistress of the magic tower must be either mad or recklessly adventurous, he commented, his subordinate immediately agreed, wondering aloud why anyone would build a tower in such a place. Baal frowned irritably, who knows, he replied shortly. As they reached a towering cliff face, Baal halted, his gaze filled with skepticism, I believe this is the entrance, if my guess is correct, the tower lies beyond this point, kill anyone who opposes. Suddenly, El appeared at the top of the cliff with a sharp rebuke, how cruel, how can followers of the divine be so malicious? El shook her head, showing displeasure as she looked at the group from the Holy Kingdom, you should treat commoners with sincerity, just as you offer devotion to the gods, isn't that right, Baal, feeling offended, became agitated and shouted, who are you? El smirked mischievously and countered, I could ask you the same question, what are the people of the Holy Kingdom doing inside my territory? Baal furrowed his brows, scrutinizing El suspiciously, your territory. Then, a daring speculation struck him, leaving him startled, don't tell me it's you. Baal exclaimed in disbelief as he realized El was much younger than he had anticipated, you're the mistress of the Golden Tower. El chuckled triumphantly, turning the question back on him, so if it's true, then what? Baal widened his eyes in bewilderment, a young mistress of the magic tower, how could it be? Then, a chain of previously gathered information began to connect in his mind, wait a moment, recent rumors about a young sorceress who wiped out the Einhardt family of the Blaired Kingdom. That's a genius mage who can create a golem knight as powerful as a grandmaster and can defeat two seventh-tier mages. As Baal pondered further, he became increasingly convinced of his speculation, if the person in the rumors was indeed him, then it was entirely possible for him to be the owner of the tower. Baal immediately lowered his voice in deference, may I ask you something, we've come from the Holy Kingdom to search for the Saintess, is the Saintess living in the tower? El spoke icily, yes, she is under my protection. Baal's expression immediately brightened, and he laughed heartily, oh, thank the gods, we've found the Saintess. However, just one sentence from El made Baal's smile fade, but I won't hand her over to you. Baal's expression turned disapproving, what do you mean? El calmly declared to him, she is my fiancée. Baal was shocked and exclaimed with excitement, what, fiancé? Everyone across the continent knows that the saintess is the most noble and pure, which means she is forbidden to marry for life, or even have physical contact with the opposite sex. Baal reacted vehemently with a resounding shout, absurd, that's never been the case. He pointed directly at El and ordered his subordinates, we must stop this at all costs, even the magic of a seventh-tier mage cannot penetrate the anti-magic barrier on our cloaks, attack. Baal's subordinates immediately roared in agreement and charged forward to search, we must bring the saintess back in the name of the Holy Spirit. El sighed and shook her head in disgust, though she had anticipated this, she still felt surprised, the people from the Holy Kingdom were indeed unpleasant, but she couldn't decide whether to call them loyal or fanatical. Shortly after, El vanished from the top of the cliff. As the people from the Holy Kingdom were smugly assuming that El had retreated, she suddenly appeared on the ground right in front of them. Baal frowned and reprimanded El, how dare you come down here yourself, you arrogant brat. Immediately, his subordinates drew their swords and aimed them at El. The group raised their swords aggressively, 
following Baal's command to attack. However, they were taken aback when suddenly a massive magic circle appeared beneath their feet. Elle smiled mischievously and triumphantly as she watched the hunters turn into prey within the circle, witnessing their comically bewildered and helpless expressions. As the people from the Holy Kingdom looked down at the magic circle on the ground in confusion, Elle unleashed another spell, creating a veil of ominous mist. Her magic worked within the magic circle, and a dark mist began to envelop the area around the group from the Holy Kingdom, they immediately panicked as darkness shrouded the land around them. Baal looked around frantically as the dark mist crept through the gaps between his troops, what devilry is this, he exclaimed. Baal's subordinates also fell into a state of chaos and horror, bewildered by the strange magic, what kind of magic is this, we've never seen anything like it before. However, Baal quickly realized that the mist was merely causing psychological pressure rather than being poisonous, he sneered arrogantly, this must be a trap prepared by the owner of the magic tower. Baal waved his hand and ordered his subordinates, what are you all standing around for, are you planning to just stand there and die, quickly enhance your anti-magic abilities. Seeing their leader still enthusiastic, Baal's followers regained their composure and became excited again, they obeyed, we must not forget our purpose here. Immediately after, the people from the Holy Kingdom raised their hands in a gesture of supplication to the Divine, seeking enlightenment and blessings. After their fervent calls, beams of light akin to shooting stars descended from the sky, gradually dispersing the darkness created by the ominous mist. El showed no mercy, but instead mocked them, using light to fight against us, then you shall taste the deadly power of the ominous mist. Once again, El reached her hand towards the sky, enhancing the magical strength of the dark mist, stealing their consciousness. With a concise incantation from El, what descended upon the people from the Holy Kingdom was no longer beams of light but a dense column of black smoke. The mist thickened and surged around the group like a powerful tornado, gradually eroding their unity and determination. El smirked triumphantly to herself, acknowledging that even Hayden, a skilled mage, couldn't escape the magic of stolen senses. She chuckled gleefully, putting on her glasses to enhance her energy focus, all right, it's time to sink into darkness. At this moment, the group from the Holy Kingdom found themselves completely enveloped in a dense column of black smoke, robbed of their senses by the ominous mist, they quickly began to disperse in confusion. Baal attempted to peer through the mist but found himself completely powerless, he couldn't ascertain the current situation, but retreating wasn't an option. Refusing to back down, he encouraged his followers, don't panic, everyone, this is just an illusion, stay calm and recite the blessings of enlightenment. Despite their nerves, Baal's followers steadfastly obeyed their leader's command, they reached out with the intention of using the blessings of enlightenment to illuminate a path forward. However, the feeble beams of light they generated were quickly overshadowed by darkness, the struggle between light and dark continued, but darkness held the upper hand. Baal himself began to panic as his body trembled under the oppressive force of the ominous mist, O oh divine spirits, where are you, please grant us blessings, please, blessings of light, he pleaded desperately. Gradually, the strength and faith of Baal's followers standing behind him began to wane, the light in their hands dimmed, and sounds of despair emanated from them. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I no longer have the strength to push back the mist, one of them lamented, soon, the arms that had been casting spells slowly fell back in helplessness. Finally, all of Baal's followers had their hands lowered, overwhelmed by fear that overtook their will and ambition, Great Baal, please help us, they pleaded, acknowledging their leader's authority. Meanwhile, around El's magic tower, the knights of the Manticore Valley were fully equipped and anxiously awaiting orders from El. Mitre, the commander of the army, couldn't help but feel restless, shouldn't the owner of the magic tower be back by now? Just then, El returned cheerfully with a radiant smile, carrying Baal, who was unconscious, on her shoulder, I'm back, El announced, 
Miter's face lit up at the sight of El, feeling relieved, our master, he exclaimed with a sense of relief. El released Baal to the ground, but he remained unconscious, his face pale from the ordeal of fainting in horror and exhaustion. Miter immediately sat down, looking disdainfully at Baal, is he the one searching for the saintess, he sneered, while the knights around them expressed their discomfort with Baal. Miter furrowed his brow, scrutinizing Baal for a moment before asking El, do you need us to take care of him? El pondered for a moment before shaking her head, let's wait and see how things unfold for now. Immediately, the knights around El all knelt down with a respectful demeanor, yes, my lord, they replied, whatever happens, we will always obey your orders. One of the knights lifted his gaze to meet El's with determination, indeed, we have decided to follow you, but there is one thing I am curious about. The knight hesitated before asking in a hesitant tone, can we, win? El understood their concern when facing the most powerful force on the continent, she smiled confidently to encourage them, of course, we will win this battle, because I've never known defeat. With that, El stood up and raised her hand into the air, accompanied by a mysterious smile. In the blink of an eye, strange objects fell from El's bag, surprising everyone present, they were pairs of glasses and iron rings. El distributed the glasses to the knights and instructed, these items will protect you from the effects of the dark mist, just wear them over your eyes. Then, El handed Miter a large bag filled with iron rings, these bracelets can seal magical powers, use them to capture the knights within the dark mist, she instructed. Miter examined one of the iron rings curiously, prompting El to explain further, once locked by it, they'll only have strength equivalent to ordinary people. Soon after, Miter's group reached the area beneath the cliff, shrouded by the dense black mist, they're here, let's go in, Miter said. The people of the Holy Kingdom were still unable to escape the dark mist, all of them exhausted and desperate as they collapsed to the ground. One of Baal's subordinates vaguely sensed the presence of someone else in the mist but couldn't see clearly. It wasn't until most of the subordinates under his command had been captured that he could see what was happening. He was filled with panic, trembling with a mixture of anger and helplessness, cursing and swearing, then, he struggled to stand up to find a way to resist. He viciously lunged towards a knight of the Manticore Valley with all his remaining strength. However, Miter simply gently raised his knee into the assailant's stomach, causing him to double over in pain so intense it made him retch bile. Immediately, his heavy, powerless body collapsed to the ground, convulsing in agony. Nevertheless, he still had enough clarity of mind to grit his teeth and resist Miter's attempts to detain him. As Miter bound his hands, his eyelids grew heavy, and his consciousness became blurred, yet he still whispered to himself with a faint glimmer of willpower, I can't, lose here, I mustn't. Just half an hour later, Miter and the knights brought the captured individuals of the Holy Kingdom before El, who was waiting atop the cliff, Miter announced triumphantly, we have apprehended them all. El smiled contentedly and said to Miter, I'm pleased that everything has gone smoothly, they will have to stay here for a while longer, so treat them carefully to avoid further casualties. Despite a slight underlying worry, El was brimming with confidence and fighting spirit, the real war had just begun, and the Holy Kingdom wouldn't sit idly by. Two weeks later, out of the twelve cardinal vicars, all but Baal had gathered in the Grand Hall of the Vatican to attend an urgent meeting with the Pope. As all the cardinal vicars gathered, the Pope directly addressed the main issue at hand, it has been two weeks since we heard that Cardinal Vicar Baal ventured into the Manticore Valley, yet we have not received any communication back, surely something has happened. The cardinal vicars listened with growing unease and confusion, exchanging worried glances, Baal was regarded as a powerful figure, and the status of the Holy Kingdom was not to be trifled with, thus, Baal's disappearance left them deeply troubled. One of the cardinal vicars spoke up with a troubled tone, I've been restless lately, unable to sleep, not knowing what has transpired. The Pope sighed heavily, 
according to the last message we received from Cardinal Vicar Ball, a new magical tower has appeared in the kingdom of Tolian in the Manticore Valley, it seems that the owner of this tower has captured the saintess. The cardinal vicars listened in shock, their eyes widening, a magical tower in such a place. The Pope spoke in a solemn tone, expressing his concern, indeed, we do not have precise information about the disappearance of Baal and the righteous knights, but that is the entirety of the report we have received. A cardinal vicar promptly spoke up, proposing, regardless of the circumstances, we cannot deny the fact that our people have disappeared within the territory of the kingdom of Tolian. Therefore, I suggest we send another investigative team there, what do the esteemed cardinal vicars think, the cardinal vicars looked around the table with serious expressions. As no other solutions were forthcoming, Cardinal Vicar Artemos suddenly stood up with confidence, may I offer my suggestion. The Pope nodded quietly, giving him permission to continue. Cardinal Vicar Artemos proceeded with his analysis, this issue is far from simple, the appearance of the saintess after hundreds of years must be the supreme plan of the Holy Spirit. The prophecies state that she must be found directly, but perhaps our initial thinking was too naive, we assumed that handing over the saintess was a matter of course and didn't prepare thoroughly. We must dedicate ourselves completely to the will of the Almighty, therefore, I wholeheartedly agree with the earlier proposal made by Cardinal Vicar Pontiff, Artemos stated, his expression growing more resolute with each word. Continuing amidst the bewildered looks of those present, he suggested, I propose we send Duke Dyard, the mightiest knight of the Holy Kingdom, along with the Silver Cross Knights, our most battle-hardened troops, there. As Artemos made his proposal, even the Pope was taken aback, send Duke Dyard. Duke Dyard and the Silver Cross Knights constitute up to 30% of the Holy Kingdom's strength, with such formidable power, Dyard is one of the ten Grand Masters on the continent, he is capable of defeating several Sword Masters alone and is a source of pride for the Holy Kingdom serving as its most potent weapon when deployed. The Pope found the proposal somewhat extreme, but not entirely unreasonable, thus, he turned to the other cardinal vicars for their opinions. After a moment of exchanging glances, the remaining cardinal vicars nodded in agreement, I agree, this is the time for us to showcase the strength of the Holy Kingdom and assert our dominance to those unaware nations, they collectively voiced. The Pope stood up with determination, mobilized Duke Dyard and the Silver Cross Knights, very well, let it be done. He boldly declared, we shall send Duke Dyard and the Silver Cross Knights, along with the Grand Priest Calio skilled in magic support, additionally, Grand Priest Luxurian and Grand Priest Duo will join as well. Upon hearing the Pope's decision, some of the Cardinal Vicars furrowed their brows in skepticism, are we going to commit all of our forces, they voiced their concerns. The Pope nodded resolutely, the ones who can capture the saintess must be formidable indeed, so we must eradicate them with overwhelming force and rescue the saintess. With the Pope's stirring words, the cardinal vicars immediately felt that the idea was entirely justified, they echoed in unison, understood, Your Holiness. The Pope maintained a dignified and authoritative demeanor, yet his eyes gleamed with ambition and determination, we must show them the undeniable might of our forces, he declared. With confidence, the Pope raised his hand high, expressing his unwavering commitment to the Holy Spirit, compromise will only lead to downfall, he asserted. While the Pope and the Cardinal Vicars were solidifying their plan within the Holy Kingdom, El and Dibel were also devising their strategy to resist the opposing forces. Upon hearing El's concise account, Dibel was left stunned, unable to sit still, what, did you just say, he exclaimed. El remained calm, raising his teacup with a confident smile, looks like you're surprised too, he remarked. Dibel still couldn't believe what was happening, he tried to summarize once more, so, the saintess is actually at your place, and you've also captured the vicars and the righteous army of the Holy Kingdom, what exactly are you trying to accomplish? L only responded to Dibel's anxious inquiry with a mischievous grin, as usual. 
Seeing El's nonchalant confirmation in his unchanged enigmatic demeanor, Daibol could only massage his temples, trying to alleviate the headache pulsating on both sides of his forehead. After a heavy sigh of concern, Daibol asked El, What's going on here, you're taking on the Holy Kingdom, even powerful nations avoid conflicts with them. El set down his teacup and shook his head decisively, but this situation is unavoidable, I can't let them take away the girl I love, he asserted. Despite Daibol's continued puzzled look, El remained resolute, I won't stand by and watch them take away the people I cherish, whether it's an empire or a holy kingdom. After calming down for a moment, Daibol showed his support for El, he had no intention of stopping him, so, what's your next plan? he asked, curious about El's next move. El clasped his hands together, deep in thought, the Holy Kingdom will soon reorganize its forces and send more people, I plan to negotiate with them at that time, he explained. Daibel nodded in agreement, then paused for a moment of silent contemplation before asking again, do you have any contingency plans? El shook his head confidently, I have the Cardinal Vicar and the Knights as hostages, haven't I already fulfilled the conditions for dialogue, he replied assuredly. Daibel sighed with a forced smile, full of concern, anyway, I may not have the right to speak up, but I can support you from behind whenever you need, if you have any requests, just let me know. El immediately looked at Daibel with trust, actually, I came here to ask you for something related to the earlier issue, because we have additional mouths to feed, I want to buy more provisions, he explained. Daibel nodded in agreement, and El further suggested, also, I would appreciate it if you could gradually reduce the supply of Manticore blood to those other temples, Daibel was astonished to hear this, why Manticore blood? El chuckled with a hint of openness, I have my reasons, just follow through, and I'll explain later, Daibel didn't inquire further, all right then. Some time later, in the Holy Kingdom of Gaia, the preparatory phase before the military campaign didn't take too long, the Silver Cross Knights were always in a state of readiness for battle, so they completed their preparations within three days, two days later, when General Dyard finished his arrangements, the war officially began. Before the army set off, the Pope specially went to encourage the Knights' spirits, he patted Dyard on the shoulder, thanking him for making this difficult choice, I entrust the saintess to you, the Pope said, Dyard confidently responded, I will do my best. The Pope addressed the entire army, emphasizing the importance of Duke Dyard and the Silver Cross Knight's mission, however, he also stressed the significance of the three cardinal vicars' task, I hope everyone returns safely, he concluded. The three cardinal vicars were deeply moved by the Pope's encouragement, yes, your holiness, please trust us, we will rescue the righteous knights and bring back the saintess, they replied earnestly. Subsequently, the magicians of the Holy Kingdom were mobilized to perform teleportation magic, bending space to transport the entire army. A bright beam of light emerged beneath the feet of the knights, accompanied by swirling winds that enveloped them. Within the blinding light, the knights and cardinal vicars gradually vanished from the square in the capital of the Holy Kingdom. The destination of the Holy Kingdom's army was the Methan Plain, situated between the Manticore Valley and the territory of Count Luvius, originally part of Count Luvius's domain, it became known as the Forgotten Plain as the Manticore creatures escaping from the Manticore Valley had deterred people from approaching it. Dyer directed the captain of the Silver Cross Knights, it's been reported that the Righteous Knights lost contact after entering the Manticore Valley, therefore, we will head straight to the Manticore Valley, Captain, prepare the troops for departure. The captain nodded in obedience to the command, immediately after, the captain turned back to his troops, rallying their spirits with a resounding cheer in the name of the goddess. The Silver Cross Knights responded with a unified shout, echoing the rallying cry in the name of the goddess. Led by Dyard, the army of the Holy Kingdom boldly crossed the Methan Plain and ventured into the Manticore Valley. However, as soon as they set foot into the entrance of the Manticore Valley, they encountered a hindrance in the form of thick fog that shrouded the area, despite it being daytime. 
Dyard looked up at the rocky cliffs where the righteous knights had previously been defeated, he marveled at the sight, praising, it's like a natural fortress bestowed by the heavens. Upon hearing the captain's suggestion, Dyard nodded immediately, yes, let's do that. The captain turned back and assigned the task to a group of knights, some of you will go ahead for reconnaissance, the rest of us will wait here. However, nearly an hour passed, and the six grandmaster knights and fifty regular knights tasked with exploration had not returned, the captain of the Silver Cross Knights began to feel anxious, what could have happened? Dyard furrowed his brow, suspiciously eyeing the thickening fog, this fog seems peculiar, I will go check it out myself, he declared, the captain immediately intervened, attempting to dissuade him, it's too dangerous, your grace. However, Dyard remained resolute, issuing a command, everyone else, stay close to me and be cautious, understood. In the end, the captain couldn't defy the order of a duke, reluctantly, he complied, leading the rest of the group cautiously into the fog. As Dyard cautiously treaded forward, the visibility worsened the deeper he ventured into the valley, making it increasingly difficult to see ahead. When Dyard's lamentations echoed unanswered, he suddenly realized that there was a problem. He quickly turned around, scanning his surroundings with narrowed eyes, desperately searching for any sign of the Silver Cross Knights. Dyard couldn't help but panic, muttering, what on earth, where is everyone, damn it. Immediately, he drew the massive hammer from his back and swung it forward, first, I have to deal with this fog, he declared. With both hands, Dyard swung the hammer over his head, preparing to strike down, shouting with all his might, in the name of the goddess. At the last moment, the hammer stopped just short of hitting the ground, preventing a potentially disastrous impact, nevertheless, even this slight movement was enough to create a powerful shockwave that rippled outwards. With the force of the hammer combined with Dyard's determination, the layer of fog was shaken and dispersed, revealing a splendid city and a gleaming golden tower. Dyard stood in awe, gazing at the valley before him, a city, impossible. Dyard scanned the surroundings beyond the rocky walls, realizing that the city lay within the Manticore Valley. As Dyard stood there, still in disbelief at the sight of the city below the Manticore Valley, El's voice echoed in his ears, Well, there's no turning back now. Turning towards the source of the voice, Dyard saw the Silver Knight standing motionless, like puppets with their strings cut. Dyard furrowed his brow, looking around with a bewildered expression, what's going on here? As Dyard was still trying to make sense of the situation, El's voice echoed once again, such a pity, if only you had arrived a little later, everything would have been perfect. Suddenly, El appeared beside the rocky walls with a mocking smile, you missed the chance to be captured along with the Silver Knights and the three High Priests, seems like this is the level of a Grand Master, isn't it? Dyard stood there, perplexed, trying to grasp what was happening. L, noticing his puzzled expression, approached him with a greeting, Nice to meet you, I am Elimus, the newly appointed master of the Golden Tower. Dyard furrowed his brow suspiciously, his gaze fixed on L, Did you create all this? he asked, L chuckled innocently, Yes, indeed, it was me. L chuckled mischievously and said to Dyard, after all, they didn't come here with good intentions, what's wrong with doing this? Dyard's eyebrows furrowed tightly in anger. L continued teasing him, oh, come on now, how long are you planning to glare at me like that? Dyard still maintained his stern expression and cautious demeanor, you make a valid point, our intentions coming here weren't exactly noble. He then cut to the chase, his voice dripping with suspicion, let me ask you directly, is the saint maiden with you? L chuckled playfully and shrugged, well, if the person you're referring to is the saint maiden, then what about it? Dyard's frustration became more apparent as he spoke, you're still pretending, aren't you? L's expression hardened, and she glared at him, whether she's chosen to be the saint maiden or not is irrelevant to me, she's simply an important member of our family. Dyard persisted, 
his tone growing more irritated, so be it, but if she's been chosen by the divine, mere mortals can't defy the will of the gods. L retorted vehemently, what does the will of the divine even mean, and what do you mean by mere mortals? Dyard continued with a stern tone, if ultimately they refuse to heed their destiny, then force must be applied. With determination, Dyard raised his hammer high, immediately, the hammer was enveloped in a radiant golden divine energy. Dyard observed the swirling energy around the hammer, influenced by the power emanating from it, and L chuckled approvingly, nodding in agreement, impressive indeed, L remarked. Without hesitation, L raised a commanding voice and summoned the Golden Knights. In an instant, the Golden Knights marched forth, their arrival marked by a powerful stomp that sent tremors through the ground. The Golden Knight charged forward like a speeding bullet. Prompting Dyard to instinctively raise his hammer in a defensive stance and step back to evade. However, contrary to Dyard's expectations, the Golden Knight vanished in the blink of an eye, and in its place, L raised a magical orb high in the air and shouted, Seven demons gather. As Dyard stood there, bewildered by the sudden disappearance of the Golden Knight, a golden arrow appeared hovering above his head, in the next moment, before he could react, the golden arrow shot straight towards his chest, catching him off guard.